Racial inequality has long been a social problem, and our next guest says it's also a health problem. Joining us now to detail how discrimination affects a person's health and well-being is David Williams, sociologist at Harvard University. Hello, thank you for coming on to the program. Thank you, it's good to be here with you. You're here in Toronto delivering a lecture called Race and Health, a Healthy Future for Us All. Yes. How is, how is race a public health issue? Race is a public health issue because your race in most countries of the world predicts how long and how well you will live. So depending on what race you are, we can say something powerfully about the quality of your life, the length of your life, and how good your health will be. Okay, let's look at some numbers uh, of life expectancy of blacks and whites in the U.S. to give our viewers a, a snapshot of the disparity, at least in that country. Okay, we all know uh, women live longer than men, despite their race, mm -hmm. about into their late 70s, early 80s. The real gap here um, is with men. White men right now are living to their mid-70s, black men just below 70. What do you infer from those numbers? Um, I inf those numbers remind us of a trend that has existed from the earliest health data in the United States, and that is that whites live longer than blacks. And although the good news is that life expectancy for both whites and blacks have increased over time, and we've had some narrowing of the health gap, we still have the persistence of that racial gap in health. And importantly, it reflects the fact that we still have the persistence of social inequalities. Race is in part a proxy for social inequality in society. Uh, from that chart, life expectancy for black women still higher than white men. What's that about? Black women have made progress over time. There is a racial gap in health. There's also a gender gap in health. So black women are disadvantaged compared to white women, but they do slightly better than white males. Scientists determined um, a long time ago that, that race is, is a social construct rather than, than a, a biological category. So how can there be a, a different life expectancy then for blacks and whites? That's a really good question. I, I like to think of it this way. The fact that you and I know what race we belong to tells us more about our society than about our biological makeup. Because race is not capturing much about biological distinctiveness. The superficial external characteristics that, that race reflects doesn't have much to do with whether we get sick or not. Whether we get sick or not has to do with the opportunities to be healthy in the places where we spend most of our time. Our homes, our communities, um, our workplaces, and race in most societies reflects differential access to the desirable goods and resources in a society. So basically what I'm saying is, blacks and other disadvantaged groups in the United States, like American Indians and increasingly uh, Hispanic uh, uh, populations um, and Pacific Islanders, have worse health than whites because they tend to live in poorer neighborhoods, because they have higher levels of stress, and the stress linked to racism is one type of stress we can talk more about. Um, but in general, they, they have lower levels of income, they have jobs where they have higher levels of, of negative occupational exposures. So as you go across every domain of life, they are socially disadvantaged and our bodies keep track and keep a record of all the negative exposures that we have and so we have racial differences in health and in life expectancy. So disparities caused by socioeconomic status? Disparities caused by larger so social inequalities including socioeconomic status, absolutely. Okay, we often talk about, you know, um, outcomes based, based on demographics like middle class family, for yes. example, how they do. So should a black or Latino middle class family expect to have the same uh, health outcomes as a white middle class family? That's a really good question. When I started my academic career and research in this area some 25 years ago, most researchers believed that the racial differences simply reflected differences in income, education, and occupation. And if you compared blacks and whites at the same level of income and wealth and education, there would be no racial difference. What we now know is that yes, there are large gaps in health by education. So middle-class blacks do a lot better and live a lot longer than poor blacks. Mm -hmm. 
but at every level of income and education, blacks still have poor health. So in addition to the standard risk factors linked to education and income, there is something else about race that matters. And I have been doing work trying to unpack what else it is about race and what are the ways in which the experience of being black in a society has consequences for health. So just to be clear, the, that same black middle class family, mm -hmm. higher healthy outcomes than a poor white family? Um, in, in some analyses, yes. But remember, at every level of income and education, that a uh, white person is doing better than a black person with the same level of, of education as he or she has. OK, what do you attribute that to? So we, we, are, we are trying to understand what else it is about race. And I think we think it's, it's, it's three things. Number one, if you look at a college-educated black person today, so their social status is high. But a college-educated black person today is more likely to have been born poor, more likely to have experienced deficits in access to good nutrition and access to good medical care in early childhood. Higher levels of what we call early childhood adversities, the toxic stressors in childhood. And our bodies keep a record of all our lifetime exposures so that even if today you are high status, you still suffer for some of the earlier life exposures. So that's number one. You've, we've got to take a life course perspective into account. Secondly, in the United States, all the indicators of socioeconomic status are not equivalent across race. What do I mean by that? I mean, if you look at, on average, a level of education, at the same level of education, whites earn more income than blacks. And on average, income in the hands of a white person buys more goods and services than in the hands of a black person. And that may sound really crazy, because on average, blacks live in worse places. But the cost of goods and services are higher. The the rent per square foot is higher. The cost of insurance is higher. The cost of a lot of goods and services are higher in the poor places where blacks and Hispanics are more likely to live. So you, they don't get as much purchasing power of mm. income. And at every level of income, at similar levels of income, whites have greater wealth than blacks. And, you know, income is the flow of resources into the household. Wealth is the economic reserves that blacks have. So that's the second issue that even though we're saying they are equivalent, they're not really equivalent. But thirdly, and, and most importantly, I think, for our conversation, the R word. Racism still matters for health in multiple ways. Well, as you say, it, the, there are a, a range of reasons yes. of why these health disparities exist. Absolutely. So I want to pick up on the third one, okay. the R word, as you said. Yes. How can you be certain that it's racism? That is very good question. We, racism operates in multiple ways. Um, there are scholars who have studied racism over time. So I'll give you one example of racism that most people don't even think about. Racism operates through institutional mechanisms. And what we mean by that, it's not what any individual person does. There's no, no action on the part of an individual person, but there are policies and procedures that can, could have been put in place 50 years ago, 100 years ago, that still have consequences. In the United States, we have a very powerful one. It's called residential segregation. In the early 20th century, uh, the United States society, American society, developed policies to separate blacks from whites in terms of the areas where they could live. It was the law of the land. It was supported by the banks and by realty agencies and everyone had bought into these differences. Well, it's no longer the law of the land. It's been ruled illegal by the Supreme Court in the 1960s. But still, Americans today are just slightly less segregated than blacks in South Africa were on the legally mandated apartheid. So although it's no longer the law, the custom has maintained these differences in living circumstances. And where you live in the United States determines what school you go to. It determines your access to employment opportunity. It determines the quality of housing you have. It determines whether your neighborhood is a healthy community or an unhealthy one. It even determines your access to high quality medical care. 
So in the US, we now say that your zip code, or in the U Canada, we say the postal code. <laughs> we call it zip code in the United States. Your zip code is a stronger predictor of how long and how well you live than your genetic code. You mentioned postal codes in Canada. Your data is born out of the, the US. Yes. Do you have a sense of how these racial uh, differences in health play out here in Canada? We do. Um, there are Canadian researchers who have been studying. I think there's been less focus in Canada on, on the race variable, but there are Canadian researchers who have been studying race in Canada and are finding uh, similar patterns to what we find in the United States. Particularly, there's been researchers looking at discrimination, the subjective experience of discrimination as one type of stressful life experience that has health consequences. You um, uh, talked a little bit about the makeup of residential um, situation in yes. the U.S. today. Uh, I, I just want to sort of talk about the story behind the numbers. Yes. I, I know things are still slightly the same, but things have changed over the things past have three or four decades. So how has the situation changed? It's improved? Y yes. There, there are lower levels of segregation today than there was in 1960, 1970, 1980. Every census suggest the levels uh, are getting lower. However, most of the decline in segregation refers to the fact that there's now one or two black families living in a census tract that used to be all white. But the fundamental structure of the concentration of poverty of blacks in, in, in particular areas of cities and the concentration of poverty and all of the urban ills that go with that, that structure has not changed much so, in recent years. So the disparities in health haven't changed in, in three the, to four decades in the general? The disparities in health have become slightly smaller, but they're still large. Let me explain to you just how big the disparities are. Imagine a fully loaded jumbo jet with 265 passengers and crew taking off from the Toronto airport okay. and everybody on board dying. And that happened today and tomorrow and every day next week, and every day next month, and every day for a year. That's what we talk about when we say there are black-white differences in health in the United States. 265 black people die prematurely every single day in the United States. So these are huge differences that, that we cannot just accept when there is a lot that we can do <clears throat> to change the playing field and to create opportunity for better health for all. We'll talk about what we can do, but. But I do want to ask you, in terms of health treatments, uh, is discrimination manifest in those terms as well? Absolutely. Um, between 2000 and 2002, I served <clears throat> on a panel for the Institute of Medicine. It's the highest scientific medical authority in the United States. And the United States Congress had voted to ask the Institute of Medicine to answer a simple question. And this was the question. When blacks and other minorities enter healthcare context in the United States, does their race determine whether or not they get uh, good quality medical care? And the report was issued in 2002. And what we found, that virtually across every single area of medicine, blacks receive and other minorities receive poorer quality of care than whites do. I, I thought let, let me medicine give you an was example. supposed to be colorblind. It, it, it is, and, and, but, but it's complicated. Our, our, Healthcare providers are part of our society. They, they were raised in the society, and they have been fed the same cultural racism that is so deeply embedded in society. Let me give you an, an example of the kinds of differences we find. Dr. Todd was an emergency room physician at UCLA Medical Center in Los Angeles, and he asked a simple question. When a patient comes into the UCLA emergency room with a broken bone in the arm or legs, does the patient's race determine how, whether they get pain medication or not? And he found that 25% of white patients in the past year had gotten no pain medication compared to over 50% of Hispanic patients had gotten no pain medication. Dr. Todd was a good researcher. He said there must be something else. So he statistically took into account what time the patient came to the ER, how long they spent in the emergency room, whether they got injured on the job or not, whether they spoke English or not, virtually every other social demographic factor. And the strongest predictor of whether a patient got pain medication was the patient being Hispanic. Dr. Todd moved to Atlanta to Emory University, repeated the same study at emergency rooms in Atlanta, and found a black patient going to the emergency room with a broken bone in the arm or leg 
is less likely to get pain medication than a white patient. And that's just one example of a pervasive pattern across every single area of medicine. Okay, help me understand that though, because yes. it is hard to imagine that a doctor would look at someone and say, black man with broken leg, white man with broken leg, you white person will get pain medication, you black person, maybe sometimes, but probably not. How, how does that happen? That is correct. What we offered as a the best explanation for this phenomenon, for which today we have good hard evidence, is a phenomenon that social psychologists have been studying for three or four decades. It's called unconscious or unthinking bias or discrimination based on negative stereotypes. And this is what the research shows. And by the way, I want to emphasize, this is not about American doctors. This is not about Americans. This is not about white people. It's about how all human beings process information. If I hold a negative stereotype about a group and I meet someone from that group, my next two words are important. It's automatic and it's unconscious. I do it, I don't know that I do it, I will treat that person differently, that is, I will discriminate against that person and I, there was no intent on my part there was no hostility on my so part. So the negative There's, stereotype is not an individual decision. It's not an individual decision. It's based on these negative images in your mind for that group. And it's not just about race. If you have negative stereotypes about gay people, about fat people, about old people, and you meet someone from that group, you will treat them differently in a broad range of social contexts in society. And the ER is no different. And the ER is no different, and physicians and other healthcare providers are parts of the societies in which they, they, they were raised. All right, broaden this out for me. What are the economic costs associated with racial disparities in health? The economic costs associated with racial disparities in health are substantial. A study was done um, about two years ago that suggested that racial inequalities in health cost the U.S. economy $310 billion a year. And that is both the additional cost of treating illness, one, and even the bigger cost was lost productivity. When people are sick and not able to work, when people are dying prematurely, we are losing that level of economic productivity. In other words, what I'm saying is that racial inequalities in health literally hurt the productiveness of the American population and hurts America's economic competitiveness on a global level. So it's an important issue to address, not only for the wonderful humanitarian reasons of giving everyone the best possible life they would have, but also for the national reasons of having the best workforce and the most productive uh, workforce that you can have. Okay, you provide us with the data, mm -hmm. the evidence, the big question, of course, then is what do you do about it? What do you suggest health authorities, other uh, uh, governments, other authorities do to address this problem that exists, as, as you argue, not just in the United States, but in almost every country in the world? There is a lot that can be done. Remember I said that the determinants of health are primarily driven by the opportunities to be healthy in the places where we live, learn, work, play, and worship. And that means no one sector of society has the answers. We all need to work together to create a culture of good health, a culture that promotes better health in our schools, that encourages our kids to be active, that promotes good nutrition. We need in our neighborhoods to, to break the linkage between the minority composition of the neighborhood and exposure to violent crime and access to employment opportunities and access to safe places to walk and access to fresh fruits and vegetables. So there's a lot that we can do. For healthcare providers, we need to raise awareness levels that there are these human processes that occur and that you would naturally uh, treat someone differently. The, the biggest strategy for healthcare providers is to be aware that that could be me. I could actually discriminate against social groups that I am not a part of without any intent on my part. And that awareness can facilitate a number of strategies that healthcare providers can do to minimize engaging in such behavior. What about universal health care? Would that help? Universal health care would help. It's, it's not a magic bullet. Um, as health care in most Western societies is not heavily focused on prevention, so that it functions to a large degree 
as a repair shop, taking care of us once we get sick, but not being a driver of whether we got sick or not in the first place. There are preventive strategies, and I'm kind of generalizing, but by and large, our healthcare system is not focused on prevention. On the other hand, there are disparities not only in getting sick, but once individuals get sick, how long you live, what's the quality of your life, what's your level of impairment, are all a function of good quality health care. So providing universal access to care is one important step, one foundation building block to everything that we need to do to improve health. You hopeful that we can turn this around, change it? I am absolutely hopeful. There is, um, my, my presence here reflects a conversation in this country about these issues and across the world and in multiple countries, there are more people paying attention to these issues. And I think we are all people of goodwill. Uh, I think most people are shocked to hear of the kinds of statistics we are talking about. And I think we need to provide the tools that particularly policymakers can make so that they can bring a focus of health into all policies and take the steps that are needed to provide better health for all. David Williams, appreciate your time. Thank you very much for coming in. Thank you. It's good to be with you. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.